Okay, Joshua 3, do you have that? Um, now, here's what I want you to do. I want you to put a bookmark there in Joshua 3, because we're going to read there in just a minute. And I want you to find 1 Corinthians chapter number, I think it's 10. I better pull up my notes. Yes, chapter 10. I want you to find 1 Corinthians chapter number 10. We started a series last week. You can go ahead and show the title screen there. We started a series last week called Steps of Enjoying New Spiritual Victories. And uh, it's, it, it's all centers around the truth and the details of the people of God crossing the Jordan River in Joshua chapter 3. Man, this chapter is like, it's, this chapter is chunky. You don't want to call someone else chunky, but you can call a chapter in the Bible chunky. It's chunky. It's full of great truth. It is so applicable. And I really believe that there are some truths here that God wants you to hear. I'm convinced of that this morning. Would you look at me? I'm just, I'm convinced. There's some truths that God wants you to hear. There's some truths here that you're going to identify with. I am convinced of that in a room even a, a small church like this and a room this size with the however many people are in here, there's, you're going to hear something from the message like, yep, that's me. Yep, I identify with that. And, and that's what God wants. He wants to be able to speak to you. So I'm, I'm looking forward to it. And I, I want to I start actually in 1 Corinthians chapter number 10 to highlight a concept that's important to understand as you Look at Old Testament stories. Are you there? 1 Corinthians 10. Look in verse number 1. It says, Moreover, brethren, Paul speaking to the believers of the church of Corinth, I would not that ye should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and did all eat the same spiritual meat. Okay, so look up here. Obviously, the Apostle Paul would be referencing the time that God's people spent in the wilderness, traveling, following the Shekinah glory in the cloud, and, uh, and the ark of God, and lived in the wilderness without air conditioning, without swamp cooling, for 40 years, each morning, manna would show up. They would eat that spiritual meat. He's referencing that story and the details that surround that that he didn't necessarily include here. Does that make sense? Look at verse 11. Now, all these things happened unto them for in samples, and they are written for, say the next two words, so these stories that God has in the Old Testament, in particular, God's people traveling through the wilderness after the Red Sea and coming to the River Jordan, God said, I've recorded that not only to give you a historical account of what I did back then, thousands of years ago, but I've given you this story so you can learn something about how I work in your life. So what we're going to look at in Joshua 3 this is God telling, showing you a story of the way he worked with them back then is often the way he'll work in your life as, you, as he leads you, brings you toward a Jordan River so he can lead you on to victories over places like Jericho. We all have Jerichos in our life. We all have Jordan Rivers in our life. We all have, and I'm using the biblical word, shittums. That's the city that they were before they came to Jordan we all have those areas in the, our life. We all have uh, areas in our life where, where our feet are in the water. I can't wait to tell you about that, where our feet get muddy. We all have stages like that in our life. All of us, all of us. Makes me want to say, stick up your foot right now. Don't do that. I hate wet feet. I hate wet feet. I especially hate wet, muddy feet. But sometimes God leads you through circumstances where your feet are wet and muddy. Can't wait to talk to you about that here in just a minute. With that in mind, go to Joshua 3. You can lose your place in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 
Joshua 3. Can we stand for this? Would that be okay? If you're able. <laughs> Miss Betty, you don't have to stand. Miss Margaret, you don't have to stand. These beautiful ladies right up here in front, you just stay seated right there and listen to the word. How about that? It's a good deal, isn't it? Mark, he has to stand because he's naughty. <laughs> Joshua 3, verse number 1. Joshua rose early in the morning, and they removed from Shittim, again, about 10 miles east of the Jordan River, and came to Jordan, he and all the children of Israel, and lodged there before they passed over. And it came to pass after how many days? Three days of waiting. That the officers went through the host, and they commanded the people, saying, When you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God, and the priests of Levites bearing it, then you shall remove from your place, and, next three words, when you see the Ark, go after it. If it leads you to muddy water, where your feet get wet, it's okay. Go after it. When you see it, go after it. Verse number four. Yet, there shall be a space between you and it, about 2,000 cubits by measure. Come not near unto it, that ye may know the way by which ye must go. For ye have not passed this way heretofore. Look up here. You haven't been there tomorrow yet. You know what that means? You need to follow the presence of God where he gives his direction. And you need to make sure you don't get ahead or behind just at the right distance because you haven't been to tomorrow, nor have you been to next week, nor have you been to next month. You haven't been to your next job. You haven't been to the retirement that you're working so hard to save. You haven't been in that relationship that you're hoping is going to solidify and be amazing. You haven't been there. He has been there. In fact, he's there right now. He's the God of eternity. The Bible says he inhabits eternity. Whoa, think about that. That means that God right now is in yesterday while also being right here with us today while also being tomorrow with us tomorrow, whatever it is that you're going to do that you don't know about. He's there. So because you haven't been there then, and God has been there and is there right now, follow him. It's so easy. But not really, huh? <laughs> All right, what verse did I end off in? Uh, let's see. Verse, verse 5. And Joshua said to the people, Sanctify yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. And Joshua spake to the priest, saying, Take up the Ark of the Covenant and pass over before the people. And they took up the Ark of the Covenant and went before the people. And the Lord said to Joshua, This day will I begin to magnify thee in the sight of all Israel, that they may know that... As I was with Moses, so I will be with thee, and thou shalt command the priest that bear the Ark of the Covenant, saying, When ye are come into the brink of the water of Jordan, ye shall stand still in the water. Jordan. I want you to come to the water, stand in the water, get your feet wet. Have you ever stood? At the banks of a river in the water, it can be muddy, even in the desert. Verse number 9. Joshua said, and all the children of Israel, come hither and hear the words of the Lord your God. And Joshua said, hereby ye shall know that the living God is among you, and that he will without fail drive out from you the Canaanites, the Hittites, the uh, the Hittites, the Hivites, the Perizzites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, and the Jebusites. I'm going to get rid of the ites, brothers. My great God, I pray that you'd be with the rest of the message. We've read your word. We've asked for your help. We've worshipped you. We've lifted up your name. Now, as the audience shifts and we become the audience that looks to you to listen to and to be changed by you, I pray that you would accomplish what only you can do in our hearts. We need you. We love you. Help us, please, would you, over these next few moments. We ask it in Christ's name. And everyone said, 
Amen. You may be seated. I think I, is my quote up there? It is up there. Ah, I want to start with the quote I gave you last week, a commentator's view of this passage. In each generation, the Christian is brought to the place where he must choose between desert life or self-effort, failure and frustration, or in the life of the promised land of victory and fulfillment. There is a Jordan to be crossed in the life of every Christian. Unfortunately, if I were to add a word, I would say unfortunately, we do not automatically grow out of the desert experience. In other words, you're not just going to all of a sudden be out of the desert into the promised land with the grapes and the figs and the vineyards and the house. Yeah, that, that just doesn't happen in the spiritual life. You're not just going to walk up or wake up one morning and be a strong Christian. You're not just going to wake up and all of a sudden have command over your emotions. You're not just going to wake up one day and all of a sudden be able to trust God with your money. Trust God with the unknowns, all the unknowns that he places before you. That, that's just, that won't naturally happen. What has to happen is you've got to let God lead you. You've got to lead, let God lead you to some Jordan rivers. And you've got to follow, learn how to follow God. And it's a journey to grow. And spiritual growth takes time. And so, it's going to the Canaan experience as the result of a calculating, decisive steps of faith. It won't happen naturally is what he's saying. You've got to be deliberate. If you're going to grow, you're going you're to have to be deliberate. If you're going to move on to the next victory, please get this. If you're going to move on to the next victory, you're going to have to be deliberate. You're going to have to be willing to uh, get over the times when you're tired of the heat and you just want to escape. Spiritual heat, emotional heat, psychological heat. There's going to be times when you're just going to have to uh, get over how people can be offensive to you and understand that God's greater than all that and you just got to move on. There's going to be times when you're disappointed and you got to keep trucking forward. It's a decisive step if you're going to get on to the next victory. And so that's what this story represents for us. These steps that God brings us on so we can get to the next spiritual victory. And God always has a spiritual victory for you. He's always got a new victory for you. After Jericho, it's Ai. After Ai, there's other cities, a whole list of cities in Joshua. What's the next victory God has for you? What's the next project, spiritual project that God wants to lead you to and help you overcome? What is it? Oh, you don't want to answer. He has one for you. Maybe during the message or at the end of the message, if you're unsure, if you're unsure of what the next step or what the next project is, if you're uncertain about that, that's not always a bad sign, but generally it's a bad sign because as God is leading you, even if you've had previous victories, he doesn't let you stay there. He's got new areas of growth that he wants to lead you on. If you're uncertain, it maybe means that you, you got caught up and you got stuck or you got stagnant, maybe from disappointment, maybe from offense, maybe from sin, maybe from disobedience and not moving on to the next stage. So God's just going to let you sit there. Sometimes God recycles your problems. If you don't, he brings a situation into your life and he's trying to lead you and teach you that requires faith and endurance and you don't learn the lesson. And so what God will do oftentimes is he'll recycle a problem. If if you keep coming up with kind of the same issues in life, probably what's going on is God is recycling the issue until you learn it. I keep having the same people problems. God's recycling it until you learn it. I keep running into these same financial problems. God's recycling the issue until you learn it. I... I mean, I could go on and on. All of this is not in my notes, but I need to move on so I don't keep you here forever. The point is that God has some spiritual victories that he wants to lead us through. Now, we looked at two steps that we need to be mindful of that God is, is more than likely going to lead you through if you're going to get to whatever victory, whatever Jericho, whatever Jordan that he wants you to conquer I'll get to that in a minute. We're going to look at the third step, just the third step today. But I want to pause for just a moment and kind of extract 
um, allegorically from this story just for a moment. Can I do that? If you're a believer in here this morning, you need to know that God is currently in the process of leading you to the next step in your spiritual walk. There's always a next step. Right now, he's in the process of doing that. In our spiritual walk, God is always pointing us to the battle, ultimately, and the steps that lead up to that battle where that spiritual territory is won. He's always doing that. But, but what I want you to get for a moment is that there are stages to victories. Does that, does that make sense? I mean, there, there are stages to it. And it, that's represented right here in the text. Where were the children of Israel before they came to the Jordan River? The city that you want to make sure that you say correctly. Shittim. They were in Shittim. If you go back and you look at uh, the, the backside of the book of Numbers, which kind of details the history and the journeys of the children of Israel, and then also in Deuteronomy, they were in that region for quite a while. They, they were there for quite a while. And what's interesting about that, for me, I feel like Shittim represents the slow-moving preparation stage where you're not going anywhere. You're still staying in that area. There was a lot of things that got accomplished in that area where they weren't necessarily moving forward. Let me just mention some. They did a final counting of Israel and the men of war, Numbers chapter 26. Numbers chapter 27, God dealt with some civil issues. Unfortunately, there's some civil issues. So if you're going to be a part of a people group, there's people issues that come up that have to be dealt with. And so they paused why God dealt with some civil issues. There were some financial uh, I'm sorry, there were some final instructions given to the people of God about wh how they should treat the Levites, those that would minister the things of God unto them. God made sure they understood that. And I, I'm just kind of skimming the surface. There were a lot more than what I mentioned. There was also God had to prepare their leader. They had to stay in that region of Shittim where they're not making forward progress. They're kind of staged there and they're not, they're not seeing forward momentum because God had to deal with their leader. That happens with churches sometimes. Where, unfortunately, a, a pastor, he, he, he has to go through some personal growth before the church can move forward. My point is this. From our horizontal vantage point, there, there are sometimes stages where we're not making any progress. There doesn't seem to be forward momentum. But God is actually doing something. He's, he's using circumstances to make preparations for the next step. But you can't see it from your horizontal vantage point. From God's vertical vantage point, he's preparing your leader. He's preparing circumstances. He's, uh, he's uh, uh, doing a whole variety of things. And, and it's important that you understand this, that sometimes when you feel like you're not going anywhere, you just have to know Look, I'm in Shittim because God's preparing the circumstances. I don't feel like I'm making, but he's preparing circumstances. That's life. And there's going to, look, as you walk your walk of life, there's going to be times where you feel like you're, man, I'm in Shittim. I've been here a while. Not moving. I'm making forward progress. But God's working. He's working the circumstances. Amen. Amen. And then there's, I, I called it this, the sink in the mud stage. You're making forward progress now. You're moving from Shittim towards the Jordan River. We like that. You're coming to Jordan River, and uh, God leads you to new ground, to that Jordan River right there. And he tells you now, put your feet in the water. Did I tell you already? I hate my feet getting wet. Who said it? I think about mountain biking. Since you brought it up, usually, usually you can uh, identify an Arizona mountain biker because when they're riding in other parts of the country that have water crossings, they will do everything they can to avoid putting their feet in the water. I hate putting my feet in the water. But even more than that, I hate putting my feet in water and it sinks in the mud. 
Sometimes in life, as God is leading us to the next step, to the next victory, we finally are making forward progress, but as you do it, your feet are getting wet, and it's uncomfortable. In fact, as you stand in the banks of the Jordan River in the water, your feet sink down in the mud, and you can feel the mud coming up in between your toes. You don't like that, and, and, and sometimes we have stages in life where we're like that. Well, yeah, I'm so glad that I'm finally making progress, but does it have to be so wet and sloppy and, and messy? Just Sometimes stages of life are just messy and you don't like it. Don't lose your faith. Understand that spiritual victories come in stages. Amen. Oh, but thank God for those, those times when God, the dry land clearing the way stage. Don't you love that time? Oh, yeah, isn't it great? We, we didn't read the whole story, but after they step in the water and their feet get wet and muddy, it, the, the feet, their feet had to get wet and muddy before the dry ground came, before they saw the water starting to back up, and they're watching all of this. And I'm so thankful for the times in my life when I'm making progress, and, man, it's easy. God's dried my feet. The mud are off my feet. I'm seeing God move the obstacles, and you're just walking around. You're like, ah, I can't believe this. Yes, I love this, but not all the time of your spiritual stages and journey and victory are on the dry ground crossing the Jordan River. Don't you wish it was? But it's not. You can't always have the dry ground. And so I just bring these stages up to say that all of us are probably in one of these stages. Maybe you're in that stalling stage of shit em, and you don't feel like you're making much progress. And what God is probably doing is uh, working in the circumstances behind the scenes and you can't see it. Maybe you're in the phase where you are making forward moment, but you don't like it. You're uncomfortable. Your feet are wet. They're muddy. And you're kind of just standing there waiting for God to dry the ground. We don't like that stage, but that's part of it. Then there's sometimes, man, when God is leading you through that dry ground, you don't get to pick the stage. You don't get to pick the stage. You don't get to pick the victory. He's the good shepherd. Let him pick it. Trust him through every stage, whatever it is. Amen. And amen. Step number one that we looked at last week. You need to learn to expect the logical leading from God. If he's going to get you where he wants you, please listen. More than likely, he's going to ask you to trust him in ways that seem illogical. I mentioned the timing was illogical. Do you remember what chapter 2 is all about? Chapter 2? Chapter 2 is about failure. A failed special ops mission. Where two spies went out to scope out Jericho, and immediately, the first thing that it said after they come into the city is it was told the king that the two spies were there to spy out the land. Failure. You know what they have to do? They immediately go into hiding. They don't get a chance to check out the city. Hello? It didn't go as planned. They didn't check out the city. They had to run for their lives after they were hidden uh, up on the rooftop. They had to run for their lives three days in the hills uh, that were to the west of Jericho. They made it back safely, but now Jericho is on high alert. And it just so happens that God immediately after that takes them from Shittim, camps them out there at, uh, at the banks of the Jordan River, six miles from Jericho, and, and from their position, they are 700 foot below where Jericho, invisible sight and vulnerable. And so often, the timing that God has is so illogical. It's so imperfect. This is the worst time for me to move to the next stage. God does that all the time. All the time. Wasn't the right time for Moses to confront Pharaoh. Wasn't the right time for, for David to fight Goliath. I mean, I just go on down the line. So God will often use illogical timing. God will all also use illogical resources. 
They come to the river. Remember what it says in the end of chapter 3, that the Jordan River flowed beyond all its banks. It was that time. It was the harvest season, which would have been the, the spring season. Jordan River, uh, its sources come up from... Uh, uh, north of Turkey, up in the mountains, and uh, so all the snow melt comes and it's flowing, and it it's the it's the worst timing not only from that perspective, but uh, they don't have resources. There's no bridge, there's no um, not trolley um, um, ferry, there's no ferry, there are no walk on the water boots that Jesus gave them. There is no beam me up Scotty over to the other side from Star Trek kind of transport there. There's none of that. And so often when God is leading you to the next step, you look at your resource and say, this is impossible. Yes. And what I see so often is people sidestepping the steps that God wants to get them to and the new victory because they're looking at the timing and they're saying it's horrible. They're looking at the resources and it's saying, I don't have the resources. That probably means God's working. Okay. So you have a choice. You can trust God and wait. Or you can come up with your own plan. I see so often Christians come up with their own plans. They miss out on the victories. That doesn't mean your life is ruined necessarily. But it does mean you get to miss out on seeing God do a miracle over Jericho. It does mean that you get to miss out on uh, Jericho, Jordan. And then you get to miss out on God breaking down all the walls in Jericho. But if you're going to see that, you've got to trust God through the illogical resources, the illogical time. Amen. Amen. And then we looked at uh, learning to wait on God's timing. I don't need to... Uh, rehash it, but they waited three days. They were there three days without any instruction or direction from Joshua, and it makes it so hard. It's during this time. Listen, it's the go dark mode. I forgot to mention that. I didn't even mention that. There's also the stage, the go dark mode from God. Three days here. Joshua hasn't come out and given us any. We're just sitting here, sitting ducks. I can see Jericho from here. They can see us six miles that way. We're just going to sit here? We're going to let them spy us out? We're not going to make spears? We're just going to sit here? After three days, Just know if God's going to lead you, often there's going to be times he's going to make you wait. You're going to feel vulnerable. You know what God's seeing? He, he's seeing, you're going to make up your own plans? Or are you going to wait for my direction? You've got to learn to wait on God's timing. And that leads us to our focus this morning. Learn to identify God's distinct Direction. Identify God's distinct direction. Distinct. Specific. Unique only to God. His distinct direction. Now, we're going to go back and we're going to look at this. But before we do that, what I want to do is talk about maybe the times where people have confused God's direction for something that is not of God. Can I do that before I show you God's distinct direction? Would that be okay? I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> if you're going to experience the promises of God and cross over to new spiritual territory, you must learn how to identify and rely on God's distinct direction and when God gives, please listen, distinct direction it's unmistakable. You know it. It's not uncommon for church-going people to make wrong decisions because they're conflating God's leading with the deception of their own heart that says, oh, this is what God wants. And that deception of their own heart is empowered by Satan. He loves it. 
He loves it. Satan's watching you get itchy, waiting three days for instructions. He's watching you start to formulate those plans. You can leverage your emotion and your psychological distress. All the unknowns that are running through your mind, he's going to leverage your heart against you. And then he's going to get you to conflate the leading of your heart with his distinct direction and convince you that what is not God's distinct direction is God's distinct direction. Can I give you some examples? Well, God's opened a door. It's obvious. It's a door opened. I mean, so obviously he wants me to take this job. He, he provided it for me. It's right there. I didn't even come looking for it. It just came, I mean, it's right there. More pay? I mean, it's, a, it's so obvious. So God leads through open doors, doesn't he? This is why I'm asking you the question. Doesn't God lead through open doors? I heard an S word that is the perfect word. Sometimes he does, but not all the time. I heard a message. We heard a message at YouthCon that talked about you need more than an open door. And it talked about the time when Jesus fed 5,000 with five loaves and two fish. Is it five loaves and two fish or two loaves and five fish? Dyslexia. Which one is it? Yeah, that. That. (laughs) <laughs> and he does that. And all these people recognize this man is more than a man. This is the Messiah. So you know what they do? They're going to crown him the king. They're going to crown him Messiah, the king of Israel, the king of the Jews. And they're excited because when the king of the Jews begins to reign, they don't have to listen to the Romans anymore. And so the Bible says they tried to take him by force and make him the king of Israel. Now, he is the king of Israel, and he will fulfill that role as the king of Israel. And there was a door opened, and they even tried to force him through that. But the timing was wrong. And you know what it says Jesus did? There was an open door there. You know what it says Jesus did? He fled alone to the mountain. And he looked at the open door that everybody wanted, in fact, was trying to get him to walk through. And he recognized, there's an open door here. And I will be the king of Israel, but this is the wrong timing. This is not of God. And he turns the opposite direction and runs from the open door. You know, Satan can open doors for you. I see it happen all the time, an open door. And someone conflates an open door with God's will. And they make a decision, and they walk through that open door, and they miss out on what God wants, often with baggage, with baggage. Amen and amen. Also, God can close a door and want you to kick it down. That's his will. You understand that, right? So don't use the open door excuse. There are other distinct methods of identifying God's leading. Don't use the open door. Don't, if you come to me and you say there's an open door here, I'm going to confront you with these truths, and there's a lot of them there. There's a lot of them there. Don't come to me and say, this is God's will. It's an open door, Pastor. See, look, I wasn't even looking for it. It's an open door. It's easy. This must be from God. Satan can open doors. Satan opened the door for David to thrive in the land that Goliath was from. And he thrived for it. That was, not, that was an open door, but it was not of God. And David paid for it drastically. Oftentimes, also, God wants you to walk through a closed door. Do you know what chapter 2 of Joshua is about? That's a closed door, my friend. Secret ops, no longer a secret. And now the secret seal team of two, now they're running and hiding for their lives. Closed door. And they come back and they say, man, it was not open. We don't really have anything to report besides we were found out we had to run for three days for our lives. I mean, it didn't go how we planned. There was definitely not an open door. But we know this is what God wants because he said so in his word. 
So we're moving forward. So often people conflate an open or a closed door with God's will. Wrong thinking. Wrong thinking. Wrong thinking. Say wrong thinking for me. Wrong thinking. Let me give you something else here. Well, uh, we've sought counsel and we've talked to others about this and they think it's a good idea. Tell me the people you talked to. Tell me. Who did you talk to? Oh, well, I, I, I talked to my, my dad. I talked to my dad. 60 years old, a lot of wisdom. A lot of wisdom. You should honor your dad always. You should honor your dad. Can I ask you a question about your dad? I know your dad's got a lot of money and he's done really well successfully, but did your dad go to church? So the bride of Christ that Jesus loves and commends you to be a part of, he just doesn't think that's important. And if you're going to follow his counsel, the person who doesn't believe he needs the bride of Christ, you're going to trust in that counsel? Oh, but he's successful financially. Oh, yeah, okay. That's how you measure. That's how you measure the value of your counsel. I'm just telling you all the time, people come to me and say, man, we've got counsel, and I ask the people, and, and it's not uncommon for the counsel that they receive. None of it is a part of the church that they're a, a part of. None, is, none of the counsel that they received is a part of the spiritual leaders that are present in the congregation that they meet with over and over and over again, where these people that walk with God and are part of the foundation of the church uh, have an opportunity to observe you and know your strengths and your weaknesses. You didn't think that maybe asking them would be uh, the way God leads? Please. You're conflating. You didn't talk to your pastor? Now look, I'm not a lord of your life. But I am a shepherd. I mean, that, that, there is a shepherd nature. And God gifts a shepherd with certain wisdom and discernment that those who aren't shepherds don't have. I don't know what God's will is for this young man. But if this young man came to me, and I love this man, and I prayed for this man, and he comes to me and says, I've got two job opportunities, and he lays out both. I think you should come to whoever your pastor is because that's the one that God has given to be your shepherd. God's going to give him discernment, not to lord over your life. We know that's wrong. You didn't even talk to your pastor? You didn't even talk to any spiritual leaders? All the advice that you got is from this guy who has millions of dollars in his bank account, but he doesn't go to church? conflating. Does that make sense? Gracious sakes. I should have made this a message all on its own. I'm going to show you two distinct ways God leads here. Number one, the ark of God. Look at it. Verse three. Verse three, and they commanded the people. Are you with me? Say amen. amen. And they commanded the people saying, when you see the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God. I don't have time to show you all the verses to really give a deep understanding of the ark of God. But it represents the presence of God, the visual presence of God in the life of the people of God. And it's mentioned nine times in this passage alone. So what God is saying is, if you want to know where I want you to go and the next victory, what you need to do is you keep your eyes on that which represents my presence and my power, and you, you keep your eyes on that and you follow that. That's what you follow. Sometimes that's going to lead you to shit them, where you're just not making any forward movement. Sometimes it's going to lead you to the water where your feet get wet and where your feet get muddy, mud in your sandals. Yeah. Sometimes it's going to do that. There are other times that the ark of God will lead you through dry ground and you don't know how. Keep your eye on the ark of God. It's the distinct method by which he's going to lead you. And if you'll do that, 
you'll be okay. Secondly, secondly, not only the ark of God, but the leaders of God. Look at verse number three again. And they commanded the people saying, when you see the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God. Next word. Will you do me a favor? Let's go back to verse three. I want you to see it. This is important that, that you see it. So would you look at verse three? If you're looking at verse three, you're not looking at me. And they command the people saying, when you see the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God and the priests, the Levites bearing it, then ye shall remove from your place and go. Get this, God partnered the leading of his presence with the leading that he provides through the men of God for the people of God. If the people of God wanted to experience the joy of gaining new spiritual territory, they couldn't do it without identifying the priest and going after it. So often we live like we're sovereign. We don't mind acknowledging, yes, I need God's direction. And yes, I, I need to, to hear from God to make the right decision. But sometimes in all of our struggles, we, we fail to acknowledge that, yes, God does lead me, but he leads me through people he ordains in my life. God leads through people. The Hebrews wouldn't experience any joy of the promised land if they said, I, I need God, but I don't need some man to inform me how to live. I'm a grown man. Grown man. 40 years old, successful. I don't need some man to help guide me in my life to be successful. You might as well say I don't need God. You might as well say I don't need God. To reject one is to reject both. Is anyone listening to me? I'm not, I'm not feeling like this is settling very well. But I'm going to show you. We need the ark of God. It's his presence. I'm not following that priest. You kidding me? Some of the priests messed up. Back in Numbers chapter 20. Uh, I'm sorry, 20, I think 23. Some of them priests messed up. I ain't following those. I don't need no man. I don't need to follow no man to know what God wants. God would have given them the freedom to take that perspective, but they ain't crossing the Jordan River without man's leadership from God. Amen and amen. So they needed God's ark and God's leader. We live in different times than the children of God, but there are still some very distinct and very specific ways in which God leads us. I'm going to try to do this as fast as I can. I just want to be able to provide you what this looks like in the New Testament in a different age. Um, would you go to, would you go to, uh, go to, go to Psalms 27. Psalms 27. You, I think you might be able to lose your place in Joshua. Go to Psalms 27. Psalm 27, verse number four. Psalm 27, verse number four. One thing have I desired of the Lord, and that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his Say it for me. Verse number seven. Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice. Time out. He's crying with his voice. Where? Saints of God. Where is he crying with his voice unto God? Where? In, in the temple. Be, and why is he in the temple? Because that's where his beauty is. Why is God's beauty in the temple? Because that's where his presence is. Verse 7, hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice and have mercy also upon me and answer me. And when thou didst, uh, my, my notes are, someone read verse 8. 
Read verse 8. My notes are messed up here. David cries out. He's in the house of God where the beauty of the Lord is because the presence of God is there. He cries out. We don't know what direction he's looking for, but it's something important in his life. He's feeling it in his life. And he cries out. And then he tells us in verse number 8 that God speaks back to him. And here's what God says. Here's what you need, David. I know you're in a needy spot. I know you're in a tough spot. I know you're hurting now. Here's my answer to your need. Look to me. Seek after me. That's my answer to you. And God answers him in the house of God. Do you know what 1 Timothy 3, 15, I was going to have you turn there, but for the sake of time, I won't. It calls the house of God, it calls the church, the house of the living God. Listen, listen, listen. I'm not saying that you can't hear God's voice. I hear God's voice when I'm out hiking or uh, in the mountains. I'll hear God's voice in my office when I'm reading the temple. But some of the greatest times I've ever heard the voice of God And the direction of God is under the house of God, under the preaching where his Holy Spirit is there leading me. Some of the greatest times of my life. Guess where I found out that God wanted me to be a pastor? I wasn't at Walmart. I wasn't on a bike ride. That's that's how they say it in Massachusetts, huh? In in Boston. I don't know what was said. Um, can you understand how I knew God wanted me to be a church planner? It was in the house of God. How I learned how to be a daddy where my kids still love me. I learned that by hearing God's voice in the house of God. And listen, one of the distinct methods of, of hearing from God is being in the house of God. How often do you face dilemmas? Do you only face dilemmas on Sunday? Do you face dilemmas on Monday? What about Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday? Surely Satan takes a break and leaves you alone. So I I want as much church as I can get. We have three services a week, not because we feel like you're bored. I was trying to be serious and you messed me up. You messed my flow. We have three services a week because I'm always bombarded. He's always after me. There's always some kind of issue that I'm dealing with. I need answers. I need help. I need God to reset my thinking. That's why we have three services a week. I promise you, you'll get to heaven. And you will never regret making your life about the bride of Christ, the house of God. It's one of God's distinct ways of directing. Let me give you another one. God's principles provide God's direction. I want you to turn to Proverbs 3. God's principles. Oh my goodness, this is so good. This is so good. Proverbs 3, verse 5. You know this, don't you? Don't you know this verse? It's an incredible verse. Verse 5. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Okay, if I'm going to do that, then I also have to do the back side of the verse. It means I need to look at my own understanding and say, at, be- at best, questionable. At best, questionable. But I've led this successful company. You want to trust in me with all your heart? You need to look at your own understanding and say, questionable. Verse 6, in all thy ways acknowledge him. He'll lead you. He tells you this in his word. It's not uncommon 
that if you come to me and say, I'm deliberating over this decision that needs to be made, that one of the things you're going to hear me say is, what are the biblical principles at play related to your decision? What are they? Because in every decision that you make, parenting, finances, job, relationships, restoration with believers, In, in every decision that you make in life, there's always a biblical principle at play. And so often what happens is believers rely on their emotions or their experience instead of trying to identify what truth from God's word, what principle from God's word is directly applicable to my decision. And I hear Good meaning believers come to me all the time and they lay out, well, the finances, well, the, the house is this and it's a great deal or the job provides this. And I'm just thinking, OK, but what are the biblical principles directly connected to the circumstances and the situation that you're deliberating over? Tell me what they are. You've told me about the finances. You've told me about the house. You've told me about the promotion. You've told me about how there's an open door. I'm asking what biblical principles are related to your circumstance. Do you know why believers have a hard time with that? Because if you're going to do verse 5 and 6, you've got to do verse 2 and 3. Verse 3. Look at it. Look at it. Verse 3. Proverbs 3. Look at it. I don't know if it's hot in here, but I'm going to take this off. Is it hot in here? Oh, stink. Austin, would you uh, stand up? It's good to have you back. Is this your senior year? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm so excited for you. Kid loves the Lord. Um, he loves the Lord. Loves the things of God. Talented, talented. Keep that. Thank you. You're going to have to make decisions in life. You got some big decisions coming after you... Uh, graduate probably the only time that you're going to wear a tie in church <laughs> <laughs> tie didn't make you holy doesn't make you greater connected with god that's a whole nother subject anyway um you have to make some major decisions uh is there a a, a female insight Hopefully. but not at the moment right i mean he's a good looking young man isn't it i mean look at that smile look at them teeth some white teeth right there it's looking good. You're going to have to make some decisions. When you're making these big decisions, you can't help but be emotional. You can't help but think of, you need to think of the finances. But what's going to make that hard in identifying the biblical principles is when you don't do verse number three. What is supposed to be bound around your neck? thy word. I could ask him to run around this auditorium as fast as he can to jump up and down off the uh, pews, the chairs. I could ask everyone to start pushing him around and, and he would be frazzled. He might lose his glasses. He might lose his hat. He might have some hair pulled out of his face or chin. But the likelihood of this coming off is extremely low. You know why? It's bound around his neck. It's bound around his neck. Do you know how it gets bound around your neck? You got to get in the word of God every day. You got to meditate at Psalms chapter one. And the reason why so many believers make emotional decisions that are not of God's distinct leadership is because they don't spend time binding God's word around their neck. Sorry to pound you like that. Okay. I'm going to finish without a tie. You may be seated. Thank you for the Thank great example that you...
And that's so, I mean, it's just so obvious. If you're not familiar with the word of God, how are you going to rely on the word of God in the heat of the moment? You're, uh, the, here's the answer. You're not. So get in the word of God. It's God's distinct method. Number three, good night. Number three, God provides pastors for his direction. Would you, would you find Hebrews? Turn quickly to Hebrews. I'm almost done. Turn quickly to Hebrews. We've got two more sections that we need to look at of Scripture. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just file through this very quickly. Look at Hebrews 13. Hebrews 13, verse number 7. Hebrews 13, verse no, number 7. This is not popular in American Christianity today. I, I can't understand why it's at least questionable, this verse. Hebrews 13 and verse 7. What's the first word of verse 7? Remember. Remember them which have rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God. Who do you think that's talking about? The pastor of the church that you go to who preaches to you on a regular basis. And it says, look, what should you do? Follow their example. Considering the end of their conversation. Look at verse, just to make sure that whoever wrote Hebrews, whether it's Paul or some other man, just to make sure we understood. And we're like, mm, that's kind of like a, a one-off kind of statement. He says it again in verse 17. Obey them that have rule over you. Submit yourselves. Why? Why? They want what's they they watch on behalf of God for you. Just like the priests. To rule doesn't mean that I say you can never leave Northway, but I would love to say that. I would love to say that. But that's that, that's lordship. That's not ruling according to Christ. So, does that make sense? Americans Christianity what, I think what has happened, what it's caused us to not rely on pastoral leadership and direction is all the failures that has happened, all the abuses of powers and failures among American pastors. Amen. I'm not sure it's necessarily happening more than what it used to 40 years ago. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. I don't know. But here's what I do know. It's a lot easier to find out about it nowadays. Social media, news, and they love highlighting the failures of people who represent God. Love, love, love. Love, 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 love. This is Q. Also loves God. He is not coming to this church because I'm cool. There's a lot cooler pastors out there. He loves this church and comes here because he gets fed the richness of God's word. I think. I think that's why he comes. Who's this lady? My girlfriend. Yeah. Um, it may be God's will that they marry someday. That may be. I don't know. That may be. Sorry to put you on the spot. This was not in my notes. <laughs> but certainly you want to get married one day, right? Mm -hmm. You do? You want to get married someday? Plug your ears real quick. <laughs> plug, <laughs> plug your ears. Uh, I'm getting a ring, like, you don't hear anything. You don't hear anything. <laughs> you didn't hear anything, did you? No. <laughs> but time out. I'm not sure that's a good decision. Oh, no, hold on. Hear me out first. I'm listening. Yeah. Do you know what the divorce rate among people who get married in America is? Too high. Do you know what the divorce rate is among Christians? No clue. Huge. Huge. Do you know how much... Do you know how many people even in this room could stand up who have been married and have been hurt deeply and wounded? Because of what they experienced in marriage. Do you know how many people in the, don't, don't stand. I wouldn't call on anybody. 
God gives grace to get through all of that, even if you made the mistake and it's your mistake that caused the separation. God gives grace. Aren't you thankful for that? I mean, he's so good. He's such a forgiving God. My point is still that, that do you know how much pain has come about from this thing that we call marriage? And yet you still want to get married. Do you know why he still wants to get married? Because he understands the problem is not with marriage. The problem is, is how people approach marriage. Thank you. Do you know why you need a pastor? To get, to make it through in your spiritual walk. Here's why. Because it's what God designed. And yeah, pastors have messed up. Even in the New Testament, they messed up all the time. But you can trust God, just like Jesus trusted the authorities that nailed him to the cross. His trust wasn't in those authorities. His trust is, was in God. Does that make sense? And so often I see Christians sidestepping this rich asset that God's provided in their life so they can get direction. And I don't understand why, other than their heart is set on their will, not God's. I'm going to give you one more, and then I'm going to close. Ryan, come to the piano. Come to the piano, or whoever's playing invitation here's what i want you to do instead of reading it here's what i want you to do i want you to write this down do you have a pen i want you to write this down and look at this later i want you to write these verse references down i'm going to give you four verse references and i'm done four verse references i want you to write them down and you're going to look at them later on this week aren't you I want you to write down Proverbs. These are all from Proverbs. Proverbs 11, 14. Proverbs 15, 22. Proverbs 20, 18. And Proverbs 24, verse 6. 11, 14, 15, 22. 20, 18, and 24, and verse 6. Let me read to you what one of them says. Listen carefully. Every purpose is established by counsel. Every purpose is established by counsel. And with good advice or counsel, make war. Even in dangerous circumstances, where death is a possibility. You can approach that with confidence, knowing your purpose will be established if you rely on counselors. Do you know why we don't rely on counselors, godly counselors? We don't want their answer. You know why we don't want their answer? Because we know that what I think is my will doesn't match with what God's will is in my life. These are the four distinct ways that God provides. He doesn't use an ark, and he doesn't use priests anymore. He does use his house. He does use principles from his word. He does use pastors, and he does use godly counselors. Distinct methods. Make sure before you make any major decision, any decision in your life, you are leveraging God's distinct method by which he provides direction. Last verse is this. Exclusivity. What word shows exclusivity? David says, I'm not going to rely on myself. I'm not going to rely on my parents I rely only on God for his direction. Did it work out good for David? I didn't say, is he perfect? Did it work out good? Bible says he died a good old age, and the word of God said he fulfilled all the will of God. All the things that God wanted him to accomplish. He finished in life because he said, I'm going to rely distinctly on God's distinct methods for lead me.
Here's what I want to ask you to do this morning is commit to this. Would you commit to this? I'm going to pray. And when I'm done praying, you can actually begin praying and say, God, I want to commit that I'd live like David and follow only your distinct direction in my life. Father, I come before you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the truth from this story. You've got victories for us. You've got new ground for us. You've got higher ground for us. You've got a promised land. You've got vineyards. You, you've got blessings. But you've got a specific method. You're going to lead us there to get those things. Help us look to you and you alone. To you and you alone. Accomplish your will and help your people here assembled this morning to commit unto you. Ask for your help that they'd echo in their life and in their decisions the sentiment of David here. Await thou only upon you, Lord. Accomplish your will, we ask it in Christ's name. Amen.